Hello, everybody, and welcome to a slightly later than usual um, edition, the 104th edition of the Frank and Stan chat. And uh, for those of you watching on YouTube, you can see that we have one of our great friends, Kendra, has joined us uh, today. So thank you, Kendra, for stepping in. I think you were saying before that you've watched every single episode. I have, yes. I'm a stalwart fan. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, for those who don't know you um, and what you do, can you just sort of explain briefly, you know, um, a little bit of your career and what you're currently doing? So I um, was a teacher, like most people uh, in this room at the moment, <laughs> and um, had four headships, ending with the headship at uh, one of two, three farm entries in Lancashire and did three secondments as well whilst I was ahead. So I've been around, been through 21 Ofsted inspections. Because generally, <laughs> the schools were uh, in some difficulty. I'm still married with 21 inspections. That's a very good. <laughs> um, and then in my final headship, started to work for Lancashire Authority as a school advisor, and then a SIP, and then an advisor again and more recently work with Stan at Athena. And um, I go way back with Stan, at least 20 odd years, because uh, probably coming up 30 years now, he was my super duper mentor when I first became <laughs> a head teacher. <laughs> to tell you some tales about Stan as a mentor. Well, yeah, well uh, let's all go through that now. I mean, let's ignore what we're meant to be covering. Uh, any, any particular standout ones you want to share, Kendra? Well, the one that he was extraordinarily proud of when I, the first time I visited his school, the only thing he was interested in showing me was all the carpets in the classrooms because he was one of the first head teachers to introduce carpets. I mean, it was revolutionary. <laughs> it was all he wanted to talk about. <laughs> Oh dear. I'll defend myself then. It was the it was the difference that made to the children's attitudes. It really was. It was like we'd given them an office instead of uh, a shed to work in. So, yeah. you know, I did, it I reduced still... all the echo, of course. Did, yeah. The sound was far better in the yeah. room, yeah. and it was against all the advice of property services, who said it'll never work. You'll you'll be replacing them every year. It shouldn't. You shouldn't do it. So yeah. I was a maverick even in those days. <laughs> um, right, well, how are you, Stan? Uh, okay, I think. I've not had a funeral this week. No. <laughs> yeah, you're not wearing the <laughs> white shirt. For me. <laughs> um, well, uh, there's been quite a lot going on, both within education and within government, and, and I suspect we're going to cover both of those angles. Um, but also, so that colleagues are aware, uh, the three of us uh, were present at... Um, uh, head teacher conference last Friday and that's the reason why we didn't record last week um, but I think what we wanted to do is pick up on some of the issues but also then just reflect on uh, the sort of the, some of the themes that came out during the conference and how how we saw sort of head teachers sort of how they've managed to get through it you know the mess of the last couple of years or so so uh, that's the sort of the the, the way we're going to play it and so we're going to go to stand first as always for what's caught your eye well, what's caught my eye today, uh, probably yesterday to start with, is the power of photographs and the difference photographic evidence makes to people's views and opinions uh, and the way they see things. Because we've had the revelation of basically three photographs of the same event. I, I would imagine they were taken within seconds of each other and it's caused a real furore nationally, even though most people knew about the events anyway um it wasn't as if it was a shock yeah. i think the picture stops a lot of the well maybe it wasn't quite like that and the other thing it's done i think which which will be uh, probably worse tomorrow is that people have come out now that have stayed quiet all this time and said it wasn't fair it wasn't right why have i been fined 
No, and the, the one today, which uh, I think it's going to be on Panorama tonight, where somebody's saying, you know, we were having parties all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we were it all a shocked. regular four o'clock Friday event that went into the diaries. Yeah. And, but we were shocked when he said there were no parties. We, we watched it in disbelief when he said that. Yeah. What about the you, Kendra? The thing is that from the fines, tied in with that, is I was shocked, absolutely shocked, with how many people were fined who were young, who were female, who were junior workers, you know, not the MPs, not Johnson, who only got the one, even though it's been proven that he was a lot more than one. It's just the level of, and if you bring that to education, that's like a head teacher saying, not me, go, you know, yeah. blame the TAs, blame the cleaners, blame the office staff, yeah. don't blame me. I yeah. mean, it's, I was appalled when I heard yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, the power of the photo, um, because I do remember Stan and I spoke um, probably about 10 years ago, Stan, we had the idea of taking photographs of particular schools and parts of yeah. schools and actually sort of trying to get people to consider, you know, whether or not they could judge whether there was sort of some effective practice going on just from the photograph. Mm. Uh, it wasn't really to prove that it was or not, but it was more around the debate about, you know, what could this tell you about the actions of the teacher and the, and the response from the children sort of thing. But actually, it's that, that as a training course on, on observing, I used to use uh, indicators rather than evidence but start with a photograph of a hotel reception and say, you've just landed here after a seven hour journey and you come into reception. Here's, here's a picture of it. Tell me about the hotel. And they, yeah. you know, there's nice looking plants in the entrance or so somebody cares for those. So it's likely that they care for us. There's two people at reception, all those kind of things, just from a still photograph. Yeah. But what's so telling about those photographs in uh, 10 Downing Street is I think most of us can see, I think many people will interpret them in a consistent way, you know, uh, as if there is a leaving do, you know, raising a glass, you know, holding for offering good wishes and thanks for all the work that's been going on. You know, you can see how that sort of body language is being sort of conveyed in the photographs. So uh, it, it feels as though that there are others. I mean, just put the other point, there are, I mean, there have been some MPs putting forward the view that, you know, this was just popping in, you know, it was just a, a moment in time, um, you know, but but actually this is, if it's happening, as you said, Kendra, every Friday afternoon at four o'clock, well, you I, I also know about it and it's in your own house. You know. How many, how many head teachers, teachers, senior teachers, long serving staff in schools, left schools during the pandemic without a party, without a farewell yes, assembly, yes. without a gathering of most staff rooms would would one person in, one person out. Yeah, yeah. And uh, fabricants, what he said weeks ago was absolute nonsense. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there are a lot of people of um long standing staff. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, a member of staff in, um who works for Athena, they left their school and had to have the meal that they would normally have had with the other ed teachers in the cluster, etc., was done by Zoom. I mean, and yeah. it's just nonsense. I really, it makes you wonder, sort of, as you rightly kind of put it back into t into the education setting. But we spoke, and, and I, I was criticised a bit, I think, by you, Stan, or a guest a few weeks ago about saying with this this issue is one that you can't really draw into the school setting. But actually, I do feel on this, you can, you know, how how a head teacher with all of this baggage and, and every day, another revelation, another apparent untruth, whatever it may be, even a lie, you know, how that person can actually just stomp up and actually sort of just walk in as if nothing's happened. Yeah. And put a sit, you know, if the cabinet is your senior leadership team, your middle leaders sitting around the table saying, you know, what we're doing and all this, and they must be thinking, you're expecting me to go out there and, and defend you in front of all those parents. I'm not, you know, which would be the same as going on 
some BBC news or whatever. You know, I'm just not willing to do that anymore. But it's really weird, isn't it, how they've all bought into this. They all have committed to it as if they've all gone past the point of no return that yeah. he goes, they all fall. You know, the whole thing's going to crumble. Well, presumably, if there was a change of prime minister, there'd be a wholesale change of cabinet as well. So I think, you know, slightly different from the school, that if a yeah. teacher went, it's unlikely that the whole of the senior leadership team would lose their jobs. Yeah. Um, but in, in this case, it that's what might happen. And, and yeah. that's, I don't know. There's got to be a time very soon when those who are ambitious for that post themselves start to think maybe I need to now distance myself uh, and and start to to join the criticism because yeah. I can put myself in a position to be nominated for the next role. But they've all gone on with it for far too long now, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, you know, to actually do that. You know, the the the, the, the defences they they're embroiled in the defence. They're embroiled in the lie or in the untruth. You know, that actually they are as a not, not as culpable because many of them were not there apparently they were not there but actually they must have all known i can't believe that they haven't honestly spoken about what what is going to come out in that sue gray report well, what are these photographs saying you know and, and and you think senior senior politicians in the cabinet not not really challenging you know uh and saying look on your bike you know it, 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 for the sake of the party if he's if this person stays in office I can't, I'm not saying Labour will win or whatever, but their chances of doing well, you know, are significantly reduced. If this doesn't just slow down and lose its, uh, its toxicity. Yeah. But he's lied, yeah. hasn't he, even about the Sue Gray report, because he said that she asked for the meeting yes. about the report. No, she didn't. No, yeah. she didn't. He asked for the meeting about the report, an independent, supposedly, report. And... It's just, well, I just despair. I, don't I, I saw, I don't know if you saw the education secretary uh, being interviewed about that. And then there were complaints that we weren't getting on to the most important things. But the question was, who asked for the meeting? <laughs> so if he'd answered the question at the beginning, yeah, that yeah. would have killed that part of the conversation yeah. and, and moved on to what they wanted to say. And then he was interviewed later, I think, on Sky. No, it was on BBC later. It was, it was Sky first, then BBC. Yeah. And on BBC, um, the, the presenter said, now, you, you've been asked this question already earlier. In the time that's been going, have you not rung number 10 to find out the answer to it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you hung him out to dry there. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because I'm not wishing to bring the conference that we were at last week into the agenda too quickly but you know we there was an input from a colleague uh joe dundas that i thought just spoke about truth you know being truthful being straightforward being unequivocal you know being consistent you know that was some of the sort of he was talking about you know effective communication uh and how that sort of wraps into your brand and whatever and it feels yeah. as though everything he was talking about this government appear to have not been able to do it and no. they must have hundreds of people helping them but they can't get the basics right they can't because in effect it feels though there's they're not quite sure where the truth needs to be that might not be where the truth is but where it needs to be feels as though they're not able to get their heads into that position because there are just too many too many untruths down the line that they're just going to get picked off you know uh in terms of well you said this a few months ago how come that's not true now you know um, anyway kendra what's caught your eye this week well my uh, what's caught my eye is linked to what you mentioned earlier frank and it's about the athena conference that were held last friday but the thing that caught my eye was uh, not all head teachers were there that's fine they may have chosen not to be there but one of the head teachers that i work with was not present because because he had too much work to do, which I find worrying for head teacher well-being. During the conference, not many heads did leave the room, but no. one in particular left the room three times. And at one point I went out and asked if everything was okay. No, it wasn't okay. He was going to stay at the conference because it was what he needed and what he wanted to do. But there was a real issue back at school with a parent 
and it just you think what about head teacher well being mm. why can i have to it was only a morning it wasn't the full day yes and that head teacher was under pressure other head teachers were talking about the pressure they'd been under and and the fact that one actually and probably more couldn't attend because they had so much work to do and it was such a good conference for head teacher well-being yeah, yeah. i mean it's nice having them having just a little bit of space with each other you know mm. in a way um the presentations you know you can decide yourself whether that they added value but actually the fact that those heads are able to just have a coffee and connect again and and for some because i don't think everybody knew everybody you know uh it was good for them to actually have the chance just to open out and, and actually just find a few extra connections people who perhaps they haven't met who who they could actually go and have a a coffee with or phone up you know that sort of thing we actually opened the line. with that frank because i mean you you were there right at the beginning but when i opened the first thing i said we're not going to do an icebreaker but before we start, I'd like you to find somebody that you don't know and introduce yourself. Mm. And they obviously found themselves far too interesting because I couldn't stop. <laughs> them. That's the answer for future conferences, though, Stan. It's just, yeah. you know, put them in a room and say, what do you want to talk about? Michael Fullen used to do, I think it was Michael Fullen, used to do what he called a fireside chat. And he'd start the conference with find someone you don't know mm. and just have a chat. And then at various points during the day, he'd break and say, right, go and find your, your person that you were with before and talk about what we've done so far. And then at the end, talk about what you've got out of the day, mm. which I, I thought was, was very clever. I, I would have liked to have done it by swapping, you know, somebody different at this point and somebody different again. Yeah. But it was nice to see how quickly people did go and find somebody that they didn't know and have a conversation. Because I know there were some schools there uh, that have never, um, well, there were certainly two schools there that aren't Athena schools. And so they didn't know of anybody. And there was a couple of schools from not local to, to where most of our schools are uh, that had come in and I think were surprised how many schools were represented. So yeah. But didn't it do them good, those that were there? I mean, yeah. it, you could feel it. Do you know, at one point, there was uh, one particular speaker talking about values, Frank, and you could actually, um, <laughs> but you could feel the, uh, it was like the, the head teachers were leaning forward and being drawn into it. You know, they, they all bought into it. And, yeah. and it, you could see with all of the presenters that it was doing them good good yeah i mean i i think that one of the things that um i i sometimes forget is the is the the sense of isolation they've had the professional isolation and i think that i i, I was i more recently i've been conscious of going back to places a lot further back than i would normally go to you know it and and, and when i think about that i think about um trying to get it to a position where say we're looking at Plowden, the plan report. And, and it's as if to say, because we've moved on, actually Plowden has very little relevance today. You know what I mean? Because now it's about the, the agenda as it is today, but actually within Plowden, the Plowden report, there's, there's a lot of really interesting stuff, yeah. you know, which a, a lot of those colleagues, you know, we would all line ourselves up in terms of that, that, that approach, you know, um, and I think taking people back to that, uh, to a, a different place, perhaps not a better place, but just a, a place with some different sort of values, I think was, is, is useful for them to just take stock. <laughs> <laughs> Only you, Stan. Only I, you. Found, I found this when I was clearing some stuff out of my mother's. The, the price on it is three pence. Important facts for all who deal with children. And... You can read from it and maybe update the words a bit, but it's exactly right. You know, fear of adults established in early childhood is likely to make true comradeship in later life impossible. Encouragement is essential to the development of courage in the child. A child's fears should never be laughed at, for there's nothing cowardly in fear itself. Fear should be acknowledged, not hidden. It's, it's yeah. amazing stuff. And it's from the... English New Education Fellowship. 
which I've looked up and, and it was, it's about uh, 1953 or something, this. But it, it's amazing that the stuff in it, you could translate and it would be just as relevant today as, yeah. as it was then. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know I, you were probably teaching then, Stan. I wasn't born. <laughs> <laughs> See, I always go back to Mary Warnock and her report yes. and special educational needs, and there's so much good in those reports. I know, and I think at, at times, I think uh, um, it's interesting. There was a colleague co contacted me today. He's doing a sort of report for a local authority, and. Um, He's been speaking to sort of, I won't name them, but some very well known people around the country, some in very eminent positions um, about the white paper. And the, the the thing he was pushing me on for a comment was, you know, is this just about the Secretary of State creating a national local authority? You know, because in effect, colleagues are saying he, he's given himself so much power and so much control over the system that actually it feels as though this isn't about academy freedoms and about the ability to do things on your own and to follow your sort of uh, approach and the values of it. This is, in a sense, systems are being created or a process being created whereby if they don't like it, then they can they can change it, you know. And, and so in a way, that control thing is something that I hadn't actually thought about in the white paper until this colleague raised it as a concern. Um, so I know, I know he's spoken to um, a number of uh, former education secretaries who have taken this line, um, and I hadn't actually seen it. I don't know what your views were on on that. I think I think the the, the thing that academies was sold on, the academisation was sold on, was the autonomy that it would give you away from the local authority, and this white paper effectively finishes that because it does mean the Secretary of State can change your governors, mm. if they so wish, can dictate the holiday pattern, can say what the pay rates are for your staff on a national level. Mm. So there's, and there's, for me, there's absolutely no way that can be contextual. You know, it's bad enough in, in some geographical regions, to, the difference between two schools and, and their needs and, and how they best serve their communities. To, to have that power on a national level is, well, it's going to cause chaos, isn't it? Because we'll get to a point where things aren't going well in the school and you're waiting for somebody to tell a, a middle leader, to tell um, a minister, to tell the, the secretary yeah. of state, and then it'll come back down the line. Yeah. 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 I mean, one of the things um, that also we, I, I didn't pick it up, uh, as much as perhaps I thought I would. But in terms of uh, schools that are not academies, you know, within the white paper, there's this um, council mats or a local authority mats, which in effect aren't that, are they? I, I think no, that's a, not. you know, um, it's it's a hands-off type thing or, uh, you it's know. It's councils persuading schools to become mats. Yeah. yeah. It's but not... I, I wondered whether you have detected uh, a real sort of sense of, oh, we're probably going to have to get on with this now because it looks as though it's going to happen or whether you think um head teachers chairs of governors governing bodies are just going to say well let's dig it dig in we've dug in for the up to now you know let's just you know ride this ride it you know I, get our heads down you know let I the storm pass of we'll watch what's happening and we'll jump when we think if we don't we'll be we'll be placed somewhere at the, at the school leaders that I talk to that are still local authority want to remain local authority to as long as they can mm. but they don't want to be then the last picked the in, mm. in, is that not what the secondary heads did yeah in in a sense yeah yeah mm. yeah I, I get the feeling that no nobody's seen yet the seriousness of this white paper maybe because it's I think it's said its second reading now, isn't it? And it's not mm. hit the headlines because other things are, uh, are hitting the news headlines much harder. Mm. And that links to the well-being. I don't think heads have time. I no, seriously I don't think they have the time to read these things. You will get some, I'm not saying all, there will be some that will have read every word, mm. but the vast majority of head teachers, 
I, I mean, I don't know one head teacher that's that's read it. I've not no, spoken to no. anyone that's read it. Wow. And it's to do with the time and and they're so embedded in what is happening in their school. Mm. You, you, it's like the outside world will, will just let me concentrate on my yeah. own school. It's interesting, yeah. isn't it? Is it? It's a, a if you're the government, this is a good time to, a good time of the year to release the white paper, isn't it? When you've just got primaries just completed, SATs, they're, they're, they're working through other assessments. You've got head teachers in secondary schools try, struggling to, to cope with the uh, uh, GCSEs and A-levels and you know, all COVID within that and, and all the problems about getting invigilators. You know, that, that's the focus, isn't it, for the majority of heads at the moment. Um, so this is quite a good time to push it through. And for me, when, when it came to this type of time of year, it was looking at our year six children and thinking, you know, have we done enough? Are, are they right? Are they, are they where we wanted them to be at this mm. point? Not have they got the, the, the right levels, have they get set? But, you know, as a, as a child as, that's gone through our school, have we done the right thing by them? Are, are we pleased with what we've, we've achieved? And I think there's a lot of that, a lot of things like parents' evenings, celebration and and the best things about well yeah i would say the best things about school when you're reflecting on that and and actually looking at the child as a whole and saying what have we achieved you know if you've done all right then that's a really positive thing but but that's what i would be focusing on now as a head i wouldn't be reading a white paper because no. I, no. in a sense i'd be thinking well that won't affect me for at least four or five years it won't it won't come into any kind of uh, contact with me yeah i mean it just going on to the conference then if we may i mean what's your sort of take on it and let's go to kendra first what was your take on it well i just thought it was wonderful i thought um i know i don't normally um compliment stan but um his cho the choice of speakers the people he got to come and speak to the head teachers i mean it, it was just just what they needed so you start with the clinical psychiatrist talking and the stories they were telling about mm. um the importance of school the importance of one person recognizing a child in need a child in difficulty um do you know and then and joe with his communication so i just i mean i'm a bit in love with joe i have to say <laughs> um, it was jamie uh, last week no, no, I'm, I easily fall in love. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to upset you that I've never fallen in love with you, but I easily fall in love with um, with men that I think are on the same wavelength as me. That points you out, obviously, Stan. Um, but uh, you know, and, and Russell, the resilience coach, mm. he, he, and it was good to have Russell last, really. Yeah. and make people think because yeah. just before russell was frank talking about values and i mean frank you you could there was a palpable feeling in the room when you were speaking and people were with you and they agreed with you i'm not sure that they've got the strength to join together to follow no, what he was saying yeah. but then russell coming in and saying look if you want to do what Frank's saying, this is a way to look after yourself. I just yeah. thought it was inspired and it was just what the heads needed. Fabulous. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I agree. Uh, I, I have to reluctantly say it's done. You, you, you pulled off a really good one there. Yeah. And uh, I think also uh, one thing, little thing, which I think Joe and I uh, spoke about as we left, just that little idea of that little card in the pack where you have to, in effect, get, you know, comment on the, the day. And if you comment on the day, that's your sort of dinner ticket. So you can go and get lunch. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they were, were all I... so positive. They were really positive. Yeah. There were ideas for things in the future, which was helpful, yeah. um, including gluten-free biscuits. I've just which, picked that which... one up. Oh, is that the one? <laughs> <laughs> um, but things like that are important. If yeah. you need gluten-free food, biscuits, you might yeah. have got a gluten-free lunch. But how do we, things that are in, like that are important. Yeah. But they, well, I, they were all positive. I mean, it's credit to the, and I always refer to them as young people because they're a lot younger than I was. When I was in Lancashire and we were putting courses and conferences together, the, the team that used to do that were just so good at it that I learned by, by mm. being with them and watching them. So a lot of the things that could have go, gone wrong 
I, I'd actually learned about in in super, not supervising, watching basically that team put a conference together. So li little things that you don't think about, like uh, a register with all the all the names in and wide enough for them to be able to sign it and spread out enough for them to be able to find their school when three or four people are coming at the same time. Those are things that you learn by seeing, well, seeing it go wrong sometimes, yes. but seeing how those who, who've done it many times just slip into that. And I, I was lucky that I remembered a lot of it, especially at my age, because normally <laughs> I don't remember that much. What did you feel, Frank, as a presenter? Well, I, I found it, um, I was, I have to say, because I haven't done, I used to do a lot of presentations, um, and I, I was conscious of trying to fit in with the other speakers. So uh, this was something I hadn't done before. Um, but I was conscious of, again, picking up on that point about Plowden. But I mean, for those who weren't there, I, I picked out um, uh, Christian Schiller, uh, an HMI who, um, you know, in, in the progressive primary education was really at the cutting edge of this as an HMI. And uh, the, he never wrote a book, but he, he his um, speeches have been collect, uh, uh, collated and uh, there's a fascinating book that I always go back to um, because to me it, he just talks about the individual child and the fact that these children are all different and they all have different skills and and the issue here is around you know it, it would be very wrong in a Schiller approach to to have a, an education system that drove children into quite a narrow funnel and, and it feels to me as if what we're doing at the moment is is driving them into quite a barren narrow funnel uh, and interestingly this week um, I don't know if you saw it Stan and Kendra but uh, the uh, Ofsted produced a, an English uh, review and uh, there was a bold statement in it that said that it's quite shock you know it, it's, it's really disappointing to see that three out of ten children uh, didn't achieve the uh, national standard in English at GCSE. Well, the whole system is designed that they don't, yeah. you know. And yeah, yeah. and in a way, I, I think for me, going back again, and Kendra, you've you've watched these videos, is that, that I still go back, and it's not because he's my brother, but the the point Barry Norris made about summative assessment, and and how powerful that is in terms of ensuring that the full range of skills and uh, talents that young people have are taken into account you know when we're assessing this and and actually the funnel's quite barren at the moment it's quite narrow it feels not very exciting and if if we were looking at a mechanism for getting children back and engaged in education you know driving more and more into uh, a punishment a type approach with regard to attendance doesn't seem to be the right way to, it's probably the cheapest way to do it but we're probably going to end up with some collateral damage with some children. It simply doesn't work, you know, with, whereas if we had a more exciting curriculum, one that actually accommodated children more, had children right at the heart of it, we'd probably end up with more children being excited about coming to school. But more importantly, we'd have more teachers excited about wanting to teach in school and having freedom and flexibility and, and more, I'm not saying go wild with it, but greater, freedom to to actually teach what they think is relevant and important for the children at that time what worries me frank is that we're learning more and more about how the young brain develops and how memory works and and you know this is real revelation and what we're doing we're using that that knowledge that understanding to make sure children can pass exams better mm. That, that's the focus we must you know we now know ways we can make them memorize things yeah. and get yeah. them through an exam and you know is that what we're really about yeah. please don't say that's that's our ultimate yeah. aim of, of primary and secondary school to get children through six seven eight exams in well i know that i know going just tailing this off i know that the vast majority of head teachers at your conference on friday didn't come into education to do that mm. no you know and but they're they're driven to this um and at the end of the day you feel as though you do get to a point i mean i reached it in ofsted where you think actually i'm not entirely sure this is what we ought to be doing and you you think i've got to bite the bullet here and and i i, I walked away hmm. you know and I, I found that really painful but i couldn't fight that system but i wasn't willing to you know i wasn't willing to do what some of the cabinet ministers were, uh, 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 ministers are doing at the moment 
for defending things that you think actually I don't I, I think this is under mm-hmm. yeah I can't defend this defend this at all. But it's and, about and your own think, ethics then, isn't it? You've got it is, to yeah. have your own values, your own ethics. You can't keep doing something that's no that you don't agree with. But but the head teachers in that room, you could probably you could probably corral them around some pretty core values that I think you they probably buy in straight away. Mm-hmm. You know, but actually it's it's as a group, I think as you were saying before, that that there's just too many other things going on at the moment for them to actually find the time to to, you know, to pull together and to make a stand you know um i think and it it, it is disappointing that you know they're and not able to do that we, we fractured the system and i'm saying we the, the system's fractured yeah. so there isn't quite that collegiality that they used to have the right word that they used to be where you know let's say in a local authority you after a two or three years in headship you'd know all the local heads and you'd know who who to speak to you'd know who the mm. movers and shakers were and all that and I, I think that's fractured now because for, for all that that mats are, are working well within their mat that there's there's not that same collegiality across I don't think yeah that's my take on it I think it's interesting the just uh, the, the guy I was speaking to this afternoon um talking about the white paper you know, there was something in there though about the responsibility of mats to actually sort of serve their 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 community and and actually there's there is a a sense that how wrong it would be to simply you know select parts of your community you know and actually there is a sort of a, a growing sense that the community itself you know needs to be clearer um, about where it's going you know, and, and what say what its economic strategy is for the town, for the county. And actually schools, if you're in that county or in that town, you might have a philosophy which is somewhat different to that. But actually, if you want to stay in the town, you know, you can have your independence, but actually you need to buy into that. We've all got to be working towards that agreed um, uh, strategy. But, but only, Frank, if it's, rel- I mean, I, I... I, when I first became an advisor, the first meeting I, I was at was about school development planning and the authority's development plan. And the person speaking said, and we share this with all our schools so they can include it in their plans. <laughs> and I said, why would they? Yeah. And there was genuine shock that as a school, uh, I've been ahead like a month before, if the authority were doing something on reading, why would I, as a school who who had really high quality, you know, quality yeah. teaching reading, reading was a real success. Why would I include that in? My, and there was no sense that that was a ridiculous thing to expect. It was as if the whole of Lancashire, six hundred schools, would all have exactly the same context and exactly the same struggles to go through. And it, it doesn't work. No. And I found every time we've looked at network, networks and partnerships, what works is the relationship between the head teachers. If that grows and that develops, that forms a network that usually yeah. sticks. We had that with the yeah. uh, in Lancashire. We didn't have excellence in cities, but they gave some money to a couple of places in Lancashire that was excellence in clusters. So you didn't get as much money but you were encouraged to cluster and we used to uh, we did things like the head teachers looked at pisa saw that finland was the top of pisa so 10 of us went to finland and looked at the schools but it wasn't just the looking at the schools and learning from the schools which i could talk about for hours about why i think finnish schools are top of pisa because <laughs> uh, i don't think it's to do with their education system but um it was about the the other time the time you spent together as a cluster of head teachers who were used to meeting who were used to seeing each other who knew each other quite well so i can remember we went to uh, belfast and we were sat in a pub in Belfast in the evening, having visited schools and the education department during the day. But we were sat discussing uh, staffing structures, 
and the staff instructors in our school and one head teacher went back to Burnley and totally changed his staff instructor because he knew it his wasn't working thing but he didn't that was what he was used to and he didn't know how to change it and after we'd all chatted to him he went back and he did it it's things like that yes. that bring you together yeah. you learn from each other and mm. and and that's gone that's gone yeah well the yeah. other thing that i think's really hard is i would like to put he said i would like to promote then that we do an athena conference in finland <laughs> yes <laughs> But I think what's hard for schools, and, and I've, I've met this wherever I've gone, on networking, on, on supporting the community, it's the moment you say, well, hang on, your school might have to give up some yeah. of your staff, some of your resources to help another school down. And that suddenly becomes a real issue for, for the school, for governors. You know, why should, I mean, you get the question, whether you like or not, why should we be helping? And yet all governors, staff and everybody would all commit to a philosophy of supporting the community. The hard bit is, you know, I used to say when I was in one authority that were so keen on doing this, I'd say, OK, how many of you will lend your year six teacher in January to a school that needs to improve, say, to March? And they, they look at you as though you're absolutely insane <laughs> yeah. because they can't do that because of the impact on their school but, but, but it's right. all because though isn't it that we still we still inspect we still judge by institution we don't judge by the progress made within the community and the same sort of uh, problem around isolation and introspection occurs within government departments you know um at the point you're making i think about finland is that you know there uh, i i, I I suspect that there is a sort of broader approach to the needs of the community and probably more uh, heavily taxed as well. But actually, you know, it's about how well all the children in that community are doing, you know, um, rather than, oh, well, school A, Michaela, as a topic we haven't spoken about that, but actually Michaela appears to be doing quite well on the measures that you want to, you know, that currently are being used as a, as a sign of effectiveness, but actually, the question is, how effective is that school at supporting the weak schools around them? And is it just cherry picking children from the weaker schools? You know, I, I don't know the story to that, but I, I feel as though that, that we, we need to get to a position where your know, schools have to help one another. They're forced to do it. And if they don't do it, then they can't be judged effective. Now, see, I, I think the, the Michaela thing works but so does something that's exactly the opposite of that. If the, if the school's committed to a philosophy and the staff are committed to it, it works if mm. everyone works together. What it's not able to do, it's not transferable. And we've seen that with, with various maps who've, who've said, yes, we can, we can do our model everywhere and, and it'll work. And it doesn't because you've got to have buy. I, I'm so old, I can remember all kinds of, of things you know real books do you are you old enough to remember real real yeah. books <laughs> throw your reading scheme away and and look at real books but if you looked at where that came from which was australia i think it was a commitment by by a school to 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 use real books mm. and everybody was into it and the staff and the governors and the the parents and the children and it worked to improve reading. And suddenly somebody says, all oh, right, throw away your reading scheme <laughs> and just pick books off the shelf. You know, you were saying before about collaboration, Kendra. Uh, Walkthrough came about essentially from a guy called Alvarado in New York. And, and he did Walkthrough with a group of head teachers. And the impact of what he did, exactly what you're saying, they, they worked together, they talked together, they videoed each other. And, and picked holes in the video. I mean, that's getting a bit hard, but they did that and it worked and the schools were transformed by it. And then what he did was when he went to the other side of America because he was now the guru on, on walkthrough is how you do it. But he introduced it as a finished article mm. and it absolutely flopped and he got mm. sacked mm. because they, they hadn't bought into it from the very start of the process. So he kind of got to the end point and thought, I know how to do it now. I'll, I'll just introduce the end bit. 
and it's not about that yeah, it's about yeah. it's about wholehearted commitment to the process mm. and and relationships and the more i see it the more relationships are the important part of, of what we do well that that's one thing that was very clear on uh friday was you know the relationships that you know certainly you two have with those schools and those senior leaders you know a, a high level of regard for for you as individuals and and the way you do the way you communicate with people the way you, you you deal with people you know comes over very clearly um as a sort of the way in which i would like to be spoken to and the way i'd like to be treated you know so there's a level of respect there um i was pleased to say joe dundas has said he really likes our uh, our mission statement and and after he said you know things that say we believe is a shortcut for saying we don't actually do it <laughs> <laughs> the values that he had he thought he thought were quite strong he, he was quite into it so i'm gonna well, put that in the, the list of good things <laughs> well that, we've gone well over today well well over this is one of the longest editions we've ever had so um and there's nothing wrong with that um so can I thank you, Kendra, for joining us? Oh, can I do my 101, please? Oh, yes, of course. No, oh, I don't yes. want to extend it. I'm going to do it no, really no, no, quickly. No, 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 I, 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 I was just looking at the time, and no, you must do 101. This shows that I watch every week, doesn't it? You can't miss out my 101. I've thought about it. <laughs> my 101 is anything to do with education that has national in the title, uh. national curriculum the national literacy strategy, the national numeracy strategy, anything, because as we've said earlier, every school is different. Even schools that are neighbours are different. There is nothing, even if it's just an overview, I don't care. It should not be introduced into education. I was a new head teacher when the literacy and numeracy strategies were brought in and refused. I mean, I... I was too confident as a new ed teacher with me, standing for a mentor, but I refused to introduce them into school. What nonsense. They yeah. didn't last very long. I, I, I couldn't deliver the national literacy strategy myself. No. So I, I, I thought I time, time to become an HMI was what I thought. <laughs> I, stood up, I stood up at a conference and, and said, we're not doing it. And, and my head of English was with me and she said, Stan, can you just sit down? Can, can we not? Can we not not do it, but not do it quietly? <laughs> <laughs> well, I refused to let any teacher go on a course. So you can imagine their confusion when they were speaking to friends or other pe people and they're saying, Kendra, we should be doing a clock and, and it's 20 minutes on it. And I'm going to forget. Them. But we'll buy some big books because they're really good. We bought lots of big books, but we're not doing any 20 minutes of this, that and the other. Yeah. And the national curriculum not relevant for a large percentage of children in schools refuse point blank to have the national curriculum in my last school when I was very experienced. We spent two year, a year introduce, writing our own curriculum, a year introducing it, making sure tweaking, changing. And I thought it was far superior. And on the front, we just put, we paid due regard oh, to the yeah, national curriculum yeah, yeah. not sure we'd get away with that these days but and yeah. anything we're national on no children are not the same schools are not the same put them in room 101 please thank you <laughs> more than happy to uh so kendra thank you very much and stan thank thanks you. for a really fascinating uh chat and uh apologies to everybody who's either listening or watching that we're a few days late with this broadcast but uh uh the next guest is uh professor colin diamond and uh colin's going to be joining us uh he's been heavily involved in uh, some of the birmingham recovery work and he's also uh, a big liverpool fan and uh, he's on the liverpool education board as well so uh i'm looking forward to and i've known colin quite some time so uh it is it, you know he'll be like you kendra it'd be very easy to chat to and i'm sure uh, he'll be uh, equally as interesting so uh, so thank you all and uh, we'll you. see you all uh, in a few days time thank you Thank you.